I've been able to find indicative of compromise, strange traffic, threat hunting style things while troubleshooting other problems, things that we weren't even looking for. There's no way that's legit. Why would, why on earth would you send internal information like that to some random server? So what protections do we have in place for our outgoing web traffic? Hey everyone, David Bumble back with Chris. Chris, welcome. Great to be back, David. Hope you're doing okay. I'm well, and I'm really excited about this. Um, we were talking offline. This is something that um, you've been doing a lot of work on and you're really enjoying, is that right? Absolutely. Threat hunting is a, it's an interesting topic. It's a big world of traffic to look through, a lot of different types of attack patterns and things that we can find. So I've been eating it up and I'm excited to share some of what I've found. You have been studying this stuff, but then at the same time, you've been like using some of the stuff you've learned on real world engagements. Give us some of the stories because you, you were telling me offline some of the cool stuff that you found. So for years, people have been coming to me with problems on their networks, something slow, yeah. there's an application that doesn't connect properly. It says you could have network connectivity problems. The It's the network stuff. So yeah. they'll, they'll grab traffic, they'll send it to me, hey Chris, I just need help. And one of the reasons why I went so, um, I specialized in TCP analysis is because that's what I was troubleshooting. Right, if some, something was slow, a handshake looked weird. So those are things that I constantly was doing uh, from a consultant perspective, actually fixing things. So it wasn't difficult to bring that into the course or develop courses around that topic. But over the last few years, that's definitely been changing. Now I'm getting approached more by, by SOC teams or someone within the networking side of the house is responsible for digging deeper into a problem that comes more from a security angle. So a few years ago, and we've chatted with the, about this on the channel, I started going for some cybersecurity certifications because I at least wanted to have a good basis on cybersecurity in general, right? Just to, to get my, my hands around typically what does a SOC member know or even from a t pen tester perspective, what types of attacks are they going to generate? All the while doing that, I had Wireshark running. So I was able to get an idea of what an attack starts to look like on the wire, which is my, I'm a packet head. That's my visibility into the yep. world. Not to say there's not a thousand other tools that can help with this, 100%. We're actually going to look at that today. But from a packet perspective, I find I don't really get it until I see it on the wire. And then I can, I, I, first of all, I won't forget it, but I also can now adapt that to other tools. So what started to happen is since I've been developing more content around this, threat hunting, malware analysis and such, uh, you're going to see in my Wireshark, now I have a lot more buttons there, uh, preset filters. I've found that even when I'm doing troubleshooting for a company, it's not the network style stuff, something slow. I've been able to find indicators of compromise, strange traffic, threat hunting style things while troubleshooting other problems, things that we weren't even looking for. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was doing an analysis for a company. They were having a slow problem. Uh, they were having external traffic from their users go through this proxy that came into this big web environment. At certain points of the day, things just were dragging and dragging, but then it would seem to resolve. What we were able to find is that when we did, did our, our capture, we just captured on each side of the proxy and the users coming in and then the application. And uh, yeah. I, f I found this big burst of traffic that was happening and it started to happen regularly, like every 10 minutes or so. And I asked him, so like, should, should this proxy be talking to literally directly to one of your databases? And the answer was no. And we found that there was a bunch of SQL traffic coming back. And then that traffic on the other side was being sent to somewhere in a country it shouldn't have been sent to. I'll, I'll wow. refrain from mentioning anyone. So those types of things I start to, start to see more often because now just having more of an awareness of threats and how these types of attacks work. Now my Wireshark profiles are more configured to find them and help me spot them to begin with. But just as, as an analyst now, I'm more tuned to think in those terms. And that's where a threat hunting with Wireshark course was really hatched. Just some updates. You teaching at DEF CON, at the time of this recording, it's next week. And you just taught this content around this at, at Shockfest. Is that right? 
Yeah, I did. So we just had Shark Fest, which is the uh, Wireshark Users and Developers Conference. It happened in Kansas City a few weeks ago. Uh, and I was invited to teach this uh, threat hunting with Wireshark course as a pre-conference course. We had uh, lots of attendees to it. We had people that wanted to dig into these problems on the wire. We had a lot of fun. After that, uh, I was able to repeat that training uh, to a couple other um, organizations. And now DEF CON has, is going to be uh, in, in two different formats. There's going to be a, a four-hour workshop and then a full two-day course that is going to be happening through DEF CON. I'm basically going to be taking some pieces of that course as well as some of the uh, TCP deep dive content and sharing that again at DEF CON. That's amazing. I mean, you're going to be sharing some of that now, but I've kind of twisted your arm to create a course. So hopefully... At some point, you're going to have a course on this topic, which we'll link below. Is that right? David, you're a <laughs> persuasive guy. So uh, I, think, I think we're going to put that together for everybody. That's great. So Chris, without further ado, um, let's see some packets because you and I talk too much. So let's jump into the packets and um, you know, show us what you've got. You bet. Absolutely. All right. So first of all, before we get started, let's go ahead and set the stage. Uh, number one, I'm wearing the wrong color hat. So let's just fix that. Okay, that's better. Now I'm wearing a blue hat. This is typically a blue team thing, a SOC analyst, so we're, we're looking for attacks. But let's get a definition. What's threat hunting? Let's go ahead and take a look at a definition. I like this one. It was taken from the CompTIA website. And it says, threat hunters are IT professionals who proactively find cybersecurity threats and mitigate them. I'm going to pause on a few of these words here. First, a threat hunter. Are they just seasoned veterans within the SOC team? What do you think, David? I don't know. It can vary. I mean, I always hate that people think you, you have to have years and years of experience because you, even if you knew, you might catch something. Completely agreed. And, and here, this definition says IT professionals. Uh, you could be a, a network technician. You could be on your first job uh, just on the help desk and you could find something and you're a threat hunter. All right. So we're talking to everybody right now. We're not talking about seasoned pen testers that have been in this industry for decades or uh, SOC analysts that already have their tool set that's just like a, just a you know, Swiss Army knife and all those kinds of things. Although they can benefit, let's just get a clear definition here. This, first of all, is all IT and also proactive. Proactive means we don't wait for an alert if we're threat hunting. We're not uh, sitting around and hoping that we see some alert come up on an IDS IPS system or some other tools has been breached. Well, then we go into incident response, recovery. Threat hunting is when we don't yet even have an alert. It's proactive. Now, why is this important and what is abnormal? I'm gonna show you some uh, stuff when we get into the weeds of Wireshark here in just a moment. But why threat hunting with Wireshark specifically? Why is, why is this a good tool to add to that tool set? Well, first of all, our systems are being attacked, everybody. We're under attack. We're in cyber war. If we don't think so, then we have a false sense of security, right? We are under attack. We've got to have that mindset. Second, our IDS IPS systems are good. Yes, someone's watching the front door. That is true. Well, in most environments, or if we don't have someone watching the front door, we should at least get an open source Circata, get, get some snort going, Zeke IDS, pick one. And we need to be able to watchdog our front door. However, it's good, but it's not perfect. These systems are largely built on previously defined signatures from previous attacks. Attacks are changing every day. New threat actors, new attack vectors. So we need to keep on the watch. Also, our IDS IPS can't be everywhere all the time. I just said it. They, a lot of times they're watching the front door. But when it comes to a thief breaking into my house, there's a whole lot of other ways they could get in than my front door. There's other places within our network we need to keep an eye on. Now, this was a quote actually from SharkFest that I thought I would just mention here. You can hide processes or logs, but you can't hide packets. So an attacker, if they gain access to a system, they can go and wipe the processes, they can clean logs, they can cover their tracks. And that's going to be one of their goals. They want to try to make it look like, hey, they were never there. The nice thing about doing this at the packet level, which IDS IPS systems are going to fundamentally use to find this stuff, packets, while they can be manipulated or they, there's, there's uh, things that we can do to falsify that data, that's true. However, ultimately, that attack has to gain access some kind of way, and it's going to happen over packets. So that's why, again, the Wireshark tool set and the tools that it complements are such an important skill set for everybody to learn. 
Now I mentioned, okay, Wireshark has friends. There's lots of ways to do this. Here's just a few of them, everybody. Uh, there's a lot of tools that can complement. I'm gonna show you Brim, that's a third one over today. I'm also gonna show you a little bit of T-Shark. Um, you've seen on my channel a little bit about Ettercap. I'm gonna be continuing talking about these different tools. But one thing I don't want everybody to think is I've gotta be an expert on every single one of these tools in order to be a threat hunter, because that's just not true. Today, what we're going to do is learn how malware, there's a, a particular malware infection we're going to take a look at. We're going to see how it looks in Wireshark, look at some of the IOCs, then we're going to pivot over to one of these tools and see how it can complement what that tool finds as well. Prishy, what's IOCs? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks for asking that question. IOCs, indicator of compromise. So that means that I see something in the traffic that indicates that we've been compromised. There's a, either been a breach or we have some malware or some unexpected traffic. It's the weird stuff, something that looks weird. Thank you for asking that question. Again, why should we care? Just one last little statistic for everybody, not to scare you. Are people lurking, are attackers in my network? Well, let's take a look at this study from April, 2022, just a few months ago. This is from Mandiant. They published a report called M Trends 2022. And check this out, what they found. They did a study of the breaches that they were aware of from 2021. So for, for all of those, uh, the, those breaches that happened in that year that they were able to study, it said, in 2021, the median dwell time, so from the time that an attacker gets in until they are discovered, is now 21 days. It's crazy. Feelings? How do we like that? <laughs> They're in, yeah. they're dwelling, they're living off the land, they're pivoting, they're, they're uh, discovering, they're going through different steps of the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which is uh, basically a, a definition of a life cycle of an attack. And 21 days is a long time. Uh, how would you like someone camping out in your house for 21 days, David? <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. That's a lot of time. So this is why we need to be threat hunters. This is why we need to attack this and be proactive about it. Because our job, not just as threat hunters, SOC analysts, cybersecurity professionals, IT, anyone, help desk, is to reduce or eliminate dwell time. Get that 21 days down to as little as possible. We find them before they have that much time to discover our secrets, lock us out, put in some type of, of ransomware, whatever, the, whatever their objective is. We, we want to reduce that amount of time. So one way that this happens is through malware. This is one method. So let's go ahead and talk about, let's go ahead and get to the packets because it's already been too long since we've, we've uh, been talking and not been in packets, am I right? Chris Greer not doing packets within the first two minutes is like scary. I know, I know. Now, just to, just to tell everybody, when I do my live courses, like I just did at SharkFest or uh, I do at DEF CON, I actually put up a slide and that slide says, if I don't have you in a PCAP within 15 minutes, then I'm not doing my job and I got to walk out the room. So, <laughs> well, uh, you're, you're, pushing it, you're pushing it in this video. We get, we're very close. Hands on. Well, I mean, this is how I learned this stuff, David. This is, I think, oh, exactly. I, I nerd out. Like, I just have so much fun with it. It's not, uh, it's not a chore. I, I really enjoy it. So I, I, um, I welcome anyone to reach out, ask questions, comment below if you feel the same or if you have any other questions about packet analysis. You'll give us the PCAP, sorry, and we can put it below, yeah? Oh, 100%. So we're going to be uh, giving everybody this this packet capture, and it's called malware analysis, like a sec-malware analysis. That's my little naming convention. Uh, I'd like to show you where this PCAP came from. So there is a site called malwaretrafficanalysis.net. Uh, so this is actually uh, it's a gentleman named Brad Duncan, and he's been using this site or, or populating this blog for a very long amount of time. The reason why this is a great place to go for sample PCAPs is because he has so many different examples of infections. Not all infections are the same. Not all malware acts the same. Here we can go, we can get a sample, and he even can help step us through some of the, um, some of the indicators of compromise uh, through these exercises. People can come here, and you can go click here for these exercises. The one that I'm going to demonstrate to you can actually be found down here. Uh, this is the traffic analysis exercise Cat Bomber from May 28th, 2020. A little bit older, but it's still something that we see. We still see some of these um, indicators even in more modern infections. Okay, so... 
just want to let everybody know about that site and thanks to Brad for always letting us use this. One of the reasons why I like to use those samples as well is because these are actually, um, th these infections are let loose in a demo environment and he has some really well-placed captures to collect uh, the behavior of the malware. It's quite a bit harder when we're on a real environment and we have gigs and gigs and gigs of competing traffic, a lot of which could be normal, also in conjunction with our malware traffic. So let's go ahead and back up, learn how to drive in the parking lot, and then we'll go out into the highway and learn how to find this in a real environment. Yep. That's great. So first of all, so let me just, just do a, at a high level. I, I see a bunch of packets. Hey, I get dizzy too. All right. Uh, I, I see, where do my eyes go? Well, I'm down here at the bottom of the screen and I'm, I'm down here, I've got 13,000 packets. Okay, so kind of muscle memory, some of the things that I do just to show people some of my workflow. I just go top to bottom, just to just take a walk through. I know some of my coloring rules have been triggered. You see like this bright orange here. I got this one, this client, hello. Of course, my handshakes, I like my green handshakes, everybody. Gotta have green handshakes. Uh, those, those connections, those new connections jump out to me. Maybe another thing that I'm gonna try, I'm gonna go to statistics, conversations. Everybody that's seen our, our content together, David, should know to come here. And here we can take a high level look at the different conversations that are had within this PCAP. All right, so what do my eyes do? Well, first, this is sorted by source or destination address, whichever was the case here. It sorts this first column by address. So I see here I can see I have 28.8 and 28229 to abbreviate those IPs. So they're involved. Then I have all these other ones. Well, if I come over here to IPv4, I'm going to sort this relative start column. The reason is this gives me a pattern of conversation. The first conversation we see in the PCAP is here. The final conversation was down here. All right, so then I can get an idea. Okay, 229 is talking to this 5.1 device. And then, oh, it's also talking to 28.8. So I know that these guys have a relationship. Okay, so moving forward. All right. Also TCP. I'm just going to come here to relative start as well. What's my eye doing? I'm just gazing down port B right here. 443. 80, 445, hmm, 135, Windowsy stuff, 389, LDAP, hmm, 447, that's an interesting port, might want to check that out, come down here, 8082, okay, could be webbish stuff, we'll see, we'll find out, all right, so I got some secure web, I got some open web, I got some other Windowsy kind of things, all right, that's all stored now. Cool, let's come back out. Okay, so now we're, we're at the entry point. So one other thing that I do before I go much farther, and this is something else we've demonstrated here in, on your channel, David, if I come up to statistics endpoints, and if I go to IPv4, this is where I can just take a glance at the GOIP information. All right, so I'm talking to Germany, I'm talking to Indonesia, United States, Ashburn, Cambodia. So that could be an indication that there's a problem because you might not want to talk to those kind of countries. Is that right? If Yeah, it depends on my customers, right? Where are they coming in from? How are my applications architected? Do I have a CDN that should be taking care of Cambodia and Indonesia? If that's true, why are they coming straight to me? And what conversations are we having, right? Same thing with US and Europe. Like, like it's not that any one country we pick on or that any one country by itself would be an indicator. It's just that, is that normal for me? And it, yeah. you know, is this something that I usually see any given Monday kind of thing? Just taking a peek at that. Let me close. Okay. So you're just trying to get a big picture of what's going on. Is that right? A hundred percent. Trying to get a lay of the land. I don't open up a PCAP and go straight to the TCP window size. I have no basis to yet. Right. And, you know, that's just too, too deep in the weeds, too fast. We're, we're, we're already in the weeds. <laughs> so let's let's make this a little bit easier on ourselves. OK, so yeah, there's so like try and get like a 10,000 foot view of like what's going on. And now you can jump into the details. Absolutely. That's what I'm here yeah. to do. So, OK, I've got my bit of a lay of the land. Now, there's a few different things that I like to look for that are we call them low hanging fruit. Not all malware is advanced malware that's all encrypted over the quick protocol and is just absolutely impossible to make sense of on the wire. Yeah, there's some pretty sophisticated advanced attacks, totally. But there's also some low hanging fruit that we can watch for. Okay, so one of those that I like to look for, just go straight to web, HTTP, all right? Let's just see, 
do we have possibly a, a malware author, whoever put this together and architected it, maybe they got a little lazy and they didn't want to go through the whole TLS process for every single web call. Maybe we could find some indicators there. So if you're following along with me, you just go up, HTTP in the display filter. We come down here, we've got 26 hits for that filter. Now we can start to look through a few of these. So let's go ahead and go to this first get. You're looking for HTTP because most traffic today should be encrypted, right? Yeah, so I noticed in the conversation list that we had some port 80. So that means we're, yeah. it's standard web, right? So I'm gonna take a look at that first, low hanging fruit kind of stuff. Just yeah. what's using that? And another reason why I'm looking at that these days is because so much of my normal traffic, like you and I talking now, you you and I going to um, davidbomble.com, going to pocketpioneer.com, going to wearshark.org. If we're hitting sites out there, most of that today is encrypted, right? So if we just shouldn't have a whole lot of HTTP standard port 80 left going out to the internet. There's some but there's not gonna be a whole lot because so much of our web activity is encrypted right now. So that's why this is low hanging fruit. It's just a place, and again, there's nothing wrong with this get and this response yet. It's just that this was a quick way to say, okay, what are my gets and response strings? I noticed that I've got a couple files here. Get images, image paper, PNG. Get images, cursor, PNG. I'm gonna come back to those in just a minute. Before I do though, Literally, let's go to that first get. We're going to right click. We're going to go to follow TCP stream. Now, usually I don't first go to follow. I'm going to go to conversation filter TCP. But in this case, I want to see what is within that get string. So I'm going to go follow TCP stream. And let's take a closer look. First of all, right away, this doesn't look very healthy to me for a few reasons. First of all is my, my user region. I, I shouldn't say not healthy. I should just say my little... My little radar in the back of my mind, David, is just going, do, 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 do. There's just a little yellow alert right going on right now. I'm sending a get, and I'm using basically a kernel level user agent. It's just doing a direct curl call. It's almost like doing it from the command line. That's something that's kind of interesting. If this is coming off of someone who, let's just say that their machine, uh, that this is the IP that they're using. What is this? Uh, 28229. I might want to look up, okay, who is that user? And if it's just Dave, the secretary on the front, you know, he's sitting in the front of the office. So Dave's machine is the one generating this. That's where I'll come back here and I'll go, so why is Dave running like a, like a kernel level curl call? What, what are they doing? This could be some API that they're running, possibly. However, that's just going to cause my little radar to go up. Next, how about this? I go out to the server returns back at 200 okay, but the server's name is Cowboy. <laughs> that looks legit. My, yeah, okay. <laughs> right, but because- Curl, yeah, so just for everyone who doesn't know, Curl is like um, a command line URL tool. Um, it's not something that normal users would ever use, right? Yeah, or the the actual API, well, a lot of the browsers or the, like, the APIs are actually going to use Curl, but so into the kernel that we just don't see this user agent, right? So yeah. curls is, is very, very, very common thing. However, user usually your user agent is gonna be much longer. It's gonna say, okay, Mozilla 5.0, and it's gonna say, here's a, my user agent is me basically introducing myself to the server and establishing some of the uh, parameters of the engagement. So you can send me these languages, I accept this kind of coding, and hey, here I am. So, uh, in fact, you know, we've all seen the, some of the statistics that different websites track. Okay, this amount of traffic is coming from mobile devices or iPads or Windows 10, Windows 11. Well, the way they figure that out is by the user agent. It's the mm. client introducing themselves to the server. So, okay, we're doing like a, like a kernel level introduction, no frills, no gimmicks, nothing. This is usually pretty unusual to see in normal healthy traffic. Not to say it never happens, but it just is going to raise my eyebrow. Next, Cowboy comes back with a 200 okay date. Also, all they return back is an IP address. That's the content, all right? So that looks kind of interesting. 
that's just going to be a note to self. So I'm actually going to take and, and just take this address. I'm just going to do a little quick little copy on it. And I'm going to say close. Now with this infection, now we, we basically reach out to a server, we knock on its door and it returns back an IP address. And we can see that address again here down in our, our hexadecimal view. All right, so I'm going to take that and you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to first see, do we ever actually go talk to that address? IP.adder, because I'm like, what if it's sending me an instruction to then go talk to another machine, right? Like, hey, buddy, go talk to my buddy over here. Okay, so I never actually see that address being used. That means that I don't go and knock on the door of yet another server out there, but I'm still not in the clear. So let me just back up again. I'm going to go clear out my filter. I'm going to go ahead and go back up here, HTTP again. So now... Let's take a look at this next post. Now it's interesting here. I have this station. First of all, it reached out to this device up here. Then this next one was a post. So now with HTTP, I can either get traffic. Hey, David, give me this. Or I can say, hey, hey, David, here is data. It can go in either direction. And the method of HTTP call that I use, get, post, there's a few other ones, head, info. I can come here and I say, okay, I'm posting, sending data out to this machine. I'm just going to peek over here. Let's take a look at the IP address. Going to go down to GeoIP. Ooh, now we're talking to Indonesia. We're sending data to Indonesia. Now that could be, again, I got to think of my context. Do I have a legit system running that should be talking to, to another country? That's something that we'd have to look at. Going to come to follow TCP stream. Okay, so here, let's take a look at this again. Now, you notice our new user agent's a little longer this time. This is actually mm. a more normal-looking user agent. And I can actually take this user agent, copy it, and there's a few sites out there on the Internet that I can search for uh, just to see what type of system this is. Vizilla 4.0, so this is a little, it's going to be a little bit older. The host, usually when I'm talking to a server, in many cases, I'm using a host name. Wireshark.org, davidbubble.com, whatever. This time I'm using an IP, all right? So I'm not doing a domain lookup. I'm just going straight to an IP. But let's see the data that, uh, data that I am sending to here again, Cowboy. Hmm, now I'm posting to Cowboy. Let's check out our content disposition. So let us let me just read these names in, or the this uh these fields to you and see if this sounds comfortable, David. What would you think if I started sending data out that was form data, bill info, and card info? Anything suspect there? Yeah, straight away. I mean, who who's just going to send that kind of information to some random server in a perhaps a foreign country? Very good. So would you say that this, even if we aren't yet malware experts and have been in cyber, or we're not hackers and all the above, even if we're not at a certain comfort, comfort level yet with cybersecurity, should this kind of thing raise our little antenna? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Now, there's a very cool little thing, a feature in Wireshark. This was just one post, but if you remember from before, I saw several posts. There's a cool feature in Wireshark called stream down here. It's easy to overlook. You see here in the lower right? Right now I'm yep. on stream eight. So a stream is basically just a single TCP converse conversation. And here what I'm doing in this view is I'm extracting any clear text out of that conversation and presenting it in ASCII. All right, I could also change that if I want to, if there's any other language. However, let's just keep with ASCII. I'm gonna come down here to stream and I'm going to go to the next one. So I don't have to close, reset a filter, come back to follow TCP stream. I can just jump to the next one using the stream number. So Wireshark kicks me to the next one. Let's take a look at this. Still talking to Indonesia. Hmm. Now I'm ex exporting, exfiltrating, I'll use that word. Mail.catbomber.net, port 995. Here's a username. Oh, and here's a password. Suspect or no? No, it looks dodgy. I mean, why would the password be in clear text? And it's... um. I mean, a name like Cat Bomber is like straight away doesn't look good. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree in this case. Or, oh yeah, and we're identifying Outlook passwords. Wonderful. Yeah. Outlook passwords. That sounds a bit dodgy, yep. Yeah. So you're I'd... basically emailing, trying to, it's trying to email passwords or something, right? This is being, I am exfiltrating over web a username and password of email. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that's really dodgy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm telling, hey, here's my username and password over email. 
So basically, the, the, the Cowboy server or whatever has now just learned an email address and password. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And, and yeah. We're, not, we're not done yet. How about open VPN passwords and configs? <laughs> yeah. Um, in, yeah. In this packet, we don't see any of that. But again, it's trying. It's trying to, to kick this stuff out. Uh, how about this? Open SSH private keys. Yeah, I'm glad that you highlighted that. So in other words, it's a whole bunch of HTTP posts. In other words, it's trying to, it's it's basically sending data to a server on the internet and it's sending email information, um, VPN information. And um, what I'm seeing now is like a whole bunch of process information. Yes. And and I'll, I, while you were talking, I just fast forwarded just a little bit. Um, there's There are some encrypted conversations, 100%. But if we come back to Stream 21, everyone go ahead and drop Stream 21 in here, or you can filter for that in Wireshark, come back to follow TCP stream. And this is where we can see, okay, so our, our user agent, WinHTTP, 1 slash 0. Again, it's just not common one that I'm typically going to see for most web traffic that's being done over browsers. Also, the host that I'm talking to, I'm talking to this 203 box, we can go and ch check out who that is. See, my IP has changed. I was talking mm. to Indonesia. Now I'm, I'm, I've switched here. Now I'm posting somewhere else. This time I'm sending a process list of the system that I'm actually on right now. So how about this? What would you think if I had a user that was sending to some unknown server out there all of their system processes, their internal system information, including their name, their DNS suffix, their Ethernet adapter information. Here's our IP. Here's our default gateway, DHCP server, DNS. Come down here, net config, even the type of software that this is. We see it's an older operating system. This is why we shouldn't leave this kind of stuff lurking around, side point. Net view. I mean, look at all of this that's being sent out, right? Local machine data, yeah, use, username. It, there's no way that's legit. Why would why on earth would you send internal information like that to some random server? Exactly. And why would this, and let's think about this from a, a practical standpoint, if we're blue teamers, uh, well, how come this would still happen? Well, are yeah. we looking for it? This is web. It's being initiated from the inside. So what protections do we have in place for our outgoing web traffic? Most firewalls are going to let it blast right through. Yep. So are we inspecting this? Okay. All that we get back from that server, by the way, here's some usernames, you know, no big deal. I was going to say username administrator, username guest, all that information is being sent. Sorry, and you were going to say something, sorry. You, you, you took it right out of my, my mouth. Is that something I should expect? <laughs> no, for sure not. Yeah. And also, too, catbomber-dc, so my domain controller. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. So first, this is just a station that's just doing all this stuff. If I come down here, check out here again, here's our server, Cowboy. So we can see that we have a distributed system that's accepting this data. It's not just one isolated actor working alone on one machine. Or they, they could be working alone and have several machines that are set up to receive this traffic. However, it's not always going to just a single IP, a single server. That server name Cowboy, though, is the thread that's tying this together. So what have we learned? Let me back up. I'm just going to say close. While I'm here, I'm also going to peek at, if I say destination, let me just take a quick little peek at the GYP information. And there we go, Cambodia. So I've talked to Germany. I've talked to Cambodia. I've talked to uh, Indonesia, a few other places around the world, which is, you know, again, that could be normal traffic. However, this doesn't look very normal, the conversations that I'm having out. Also, remember, I, you, you saw me, you saw this catch my eye before, this 8082 I, uh, port number. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's just not 44380, the standard ports that I'm seeing run by. It's just enough different that it caught my attention. So maybe what I'll do, let me do this. Let me see, do I see any other 8082 traffic? I'm going to... Just go tcp.port equals equals 8082. So I definitely see it here. But if I scroll down, uh-oh. Remember our domain controller? So we had catbomber-dc. If I come down here to, I have two conversations. One is coming from 229, but I also have 28.8. Let me see what's up down here. Let me do, uh, there we go, follow tcp stream. I went blind for a minute. 
And sure enough, check this out. So this is a post from Cat Bomber DC. And if I come down here, that same process list, system info. Oh, great. Our domain controller has been infected too. It's exfilling that same stuff out to that site out there to Cowboy. This malware has compromised more than one station. I got 229. I got .8. I'm seeing those indicators come from both places. Okay, how we doing? Checking in. Yeah, I think the, um, I was just thinking of a question which we can come back to later if necessary is how do you find the needle in the haystack? And um, I think what you did, which is great, and you can fill in more detail, Chris, um, is that you went high level, like 10,000 foot, and then you notice HTTP, and you just started looking at HTTP amongst all the other traffic, and that's kind of like how you spotted the stuff. How do you do it in like the real world when you've got gigs and gigs of data? That's always the question, isn't it? I. Oh, well, actually, I'm going to show you uh, some of the things that I can do on the terminal, on the command line. Uh, and, and that greatly improves the speed that we can do this with. And also, uh, it also has some other interesting features that make this a little faster for us. Uh, right. You asked another interesting question, though, I, I want to talk about. Like, okay, so how do, you, how do you know what to look for? And basically, I mean, since, since I, I, I haven't yet had an attacker come up to me and just send me an email of the details of all of his attacks... <laughs> Right. <laughs> if I'm if I'm playing another team in the Super Bowl, he's not going to send me his playlist and his you know offensive plan you know so I can defend against it. It's what we do is we start looking. We're threat hunters. When we set out as, as threat hunters, we're first of all we're proactive. We don't wait for an alert. Uh, we also don't always know what we're looking for because we yep. don't have an alert. So some of these skills you can learn at home. Start capturing on your machine and look at the HTTP calls that your system sends. There's several different things that might jump out to you and say, hey, you know, that, that just looks strange, okay? And the more you see normal, the more you see your normal baseline traffic, the faster and better you're gonna be able to identify the abnormal. But that's why mm -hmm. I say, one of the reasons why I like teaching this way, especially with HTTP, is because it is open, it is clear text. We didn't have to decrypt anything. We didn't have to have a special one-off case where we were able to to capture the keys from a TLS proxy or from locally on a client. Uh, we're able to see this going across the wire. So that way we can learn how this works so that if something becomes encrypted, we still have some indicators we can look for. I'm about to pivot to that. Right. Because in here, let me just remove this and jump back up to the top. So when I jump back up to the top, here I can see that I actually come out the gate with an encrypted conversation. My packet number one is 443, all right? So it's coming from 28.229. Now, this is a packet number one. So this could be that a client was phished. They were sent an email, a link, something that they executed. This is the kind of thing that can go on under the hood once that link is clicked or whatever script comes down from that initial server and then it starts to actually do its badness. Okay, so that's another reason why I like these PCAPs from malware traffic analysis is it starts very clean. So here's our sin synac hack. We do our three-way handshake. The first thing I'm going to look for, again, muscle memory. Click here. Let's go to GYP. I'm talking to Germany. Um, okay, just, just, just taking a look through. What do we got? Our country code, our Thomas system numbers. We're going out and knocking on that door. Comes back. Okay, handshake finishes. And then I have this client, hello. Now, I'm going to just take a look. I'm going to show you. When we go follow TCP stream on this, it's encrypted, right? We don't have a whole lot to go on here from a clear text perspective. This doesn't mean that we're completely in trouble, though, because there's something super cool called the JA3 client fingerprint. Everybody click packet four, because I know you're following along, right? Why, why stand by and watch people have fun when you can dig into the packets, too? So, all right. The client hello is the first packet of a TLS handshake. It happens after the TCP connection. The client now is reaching out and basically establishing the parameters of an encrypted conversation. So there's some interesting things that are here that could raise our eyebrow. All right, first, it's, it's actually normal-ish to see version TLS 1.0 here in the initial part of the handshake, but it's not really common to see it down here. So TLS 1.0, first of all, we're on TLS 1.3 now. An overwhelming amount of traffic out there is now TLS 1.2 or 1.3. If I'm running old TLS, so either SSL 3.0, TLS 1.0, or 1.1, those could be 
just an indicator that this is either super old and needs to be patched or I'm dealing with a lazy malware situation where they, they didn't go to this extent of TLS 1.3 to fully do perfect forward secrecy and do all the modern stuff that we do. It was just good enough to keep this out of the view of most IDSs. Okay, so yeah. old, interesting. Now that actually forms this version field begins to form the basis of something that we call JA3. JA3 is a fingerprint of this client hello. So what else does it look for? Okay, version, cipher suites. So cipher suites, these are, this is the different uh, encryption algorithms that I want to use within this conversation. So I offer the ones that I know or I, I can use to my server. The server comes back and picks the one they want to use. And then we can complete that handshake. But these are all the ones that the client has capable. Just right off the bat, RSA catches my attention. That's kind of an old dead standard now. Shouldn't see it in the modern world anymore, um, unless it's with an older system. We've kind of moved on from RSA. But that's also going to form a fingerprint. Okay, so those 12 suites, version TLS 1.0. Also, if I take a look at some supported groups, a few other little indicators, and I come up with this full string number. Now, here's the gory details. I'll do it very quickly. 769 is actually the decimal equivalent of the hexadecimal value up here. So 0301, if you flip it to decimal, it's 769. For all these cipher suites, I just take all of these values over here and flip them to decimal. Then I get all this long string of numbers. The great thing about uh, JA3 is you don't have to memorize all those numbers. It basically goes through a hash, and then the hash value that's outputted is here. This is the JA3 hash, the JA3 signature for this client hello. What does that do? And that's in every, in every hello or every message, is that right? This is a feature that's a great question. This is a feature of Wireshark. Wireshark's doing this. And, and JA3, it's not unique to Wireshark. Uh, there's other tools that are able to do it, but basically it... Uh, it pulls out these values and we're able to get a hash value that we can then look up against a known database. So this is what we're going to do. Right click. I'm going to go to copy value. Okay. Now there's a site that I like to tinker with. JA3er.com. Let's have everybody go there. All right. So if you drop it into JA3er.com, I went ahead and copied that hash. If you come back here to search J3 hash, this is where we can paste this in, search for JA3 hash. And this looks up against a known list of hash values for client hellos. So there's tons of them out there, right? Because there's all kinds of different ways that we approach servers. It depends on our browser, our browser version, our operating system, um, the type of software that's actually generating the TLS connection. And what this is telling us is that this signature looks like a TrickBot infection. So mal spam infection traffic, hmm, malware test. So this site has already seen this before. It's already been registered as a malware trick bot infection, which is, uh, it's something that it's, it's seen before. So that's where I can come back here. And even in an encrypted conversation, I can still use the destination IP. So where are we talking to? And I can also take a look at the client hello and get that J3 string to get a vibe. Is this possibly malware? And that, that's just another indicator I can use to do some threat hunting. That's great because you didn't have to decrypt anything. Just nope. by taking that sign signature, you were able to discover that it's a malware. Absolutely, yeah. Now we could make the case, well, all an attacker has to do is just use a normal looking client hello. That happens. But we're talking about low-hanging fruit. We're talking about we got to yeah. do something. We, we got to keep scanning. Um, not all malware is going to be perfectly, perfectly hidden in encrypted conversations with just perfect user agents and perfect client hellos that will just whiz by the, the IDS, IPS. Absolutely, those exist, 100%. But there's things like this that we can do while we're threat hunting that should raise our antenna. And I mean, I like the example that you shared offline where you you were doing this in the real world. I mean, you've shared a little bit about it in this video, but you, you've been doing this in the real world where you're looking at slow traffic and then suddenly you encounter stuff like this. So it's, it's not like this is theoretical. This is real world stuff that you're encountering. 
Yes. In, in fact, um, just a teaser to a previous uh, video that you and I did together on Nmap scans and what those look like. Well, yeah. if I come up here to the SIN, if I come down here to the TCP hello, the window size, if I take and pop this guy upstairs, boop, if I say take that window size value, 8192, if I come to 1024, how do I know it's 1024? Go watch the video. But Nmap likes to use that as an initial TCP window size value. So what I did, I just hit save and now i've got it over here as a signature and what i'll do from time to time if i'm just looking at normal traffic i'll look at this this uh, window size value i literally david was just working with a customer that i just happened to throw this on the pcap and we found internal scans happening behind the ids right so a device that should not have been running an nmap scan was scanning the network. It wasn't like a blast of data, but it was just real slow, checking different ports, coming over here, checking over there. So I told them, you need to go find out what this device is and why it's scanning your network <laughs> and if that's something that should be happening. So the case could be made that, okay, I stumbled on this, but if you think there are other ways that I could do a more persistent scan against network data. I, I can uh, take a, a huge block of network data and just look through it for all window sizes of 1024. So I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. So as you can see, there's a lot that we could cover in this PCAP. In fact, I'm sure that there's a whole lot more that the viewers will be able to find a ton of detail. I think every time I look at this trace file, I find something new. Uh, but before we finish, I want to make sure to show you one last thing about this PCAP. So let's have everybody to do this. Let's go ahead and investigate those two files that the client retrieved from the HTTP server. You remember those PNG files? Let's take a look at them. We're going to go up to uh, File. We're going to come down to Export Objects, HTTP. Now, I just want to caution everybody. Remember, you're playing with live malware. Uh, there are malicious files in here that if we locally execute them, we can become infected. So what I want to make sure everybody does not do, do not, under any circumstances, come down here and say save all and extract these PNG files and locally execute them. Leave them alone. You're fine looking at them here uh, in the packet format, but we want to make sure we don't extract them and execute them. Okay, but let's just take a look at those names. IMG paper PNG cursor.png. Okay. So let's go ahead and say close. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and I'm actually, when I clicked on one of those files, it jumped me there in the packets. So I'm going to take a look at one of those. I'm just going to right click this and just do first conversation filter. And I just want to go TCP. Now, if I take a look up, up, up on top here, so here the client is reaching out and it's saying, Hey, since in act, there's my handshake. It's getting cursor.png. That was one of the files it was requesting. Let's just see where this IP address is located while we're here. Okay, this is actually in the US at nodes direct. Okay, interesting. Now, if I come down here, I'm getting cursor.png is the name of the file. But if we take a look at the response, check out this first packet of response and we can come over here. In fact, let's go ahead and just right click follow TCP stream. Okay, so here we are on the stream data. Now here we can see we do that request, and again, we're doing it to a host IP, not to a host name. But down here when we request it, here we can see MZ is the initial part of that file header. Now MZ, those are the initials of one of the gentlemen that had a hand in creating DOS, basically. So MZ is at the start of every, every executable or binary file that we see um, in that actual header information. Over here, we can actually see as well, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So that tells us that this is not actually a PNG file because that would be an image. We're actually retrieving an executable file that's being hidden behind that cursor.png file name. So another indicator here of this malware and what it's trying to do and that it's up to no good if we're downloading hidden executables. Okay, so uh, Brim is one, if you're a threat hunter, you should have in your toolbox. And what it does is it, it basically takes PCAP data like we just saw, and it generates Zeek logs off of it, and then it allows us to search those logs. So all I did was I opened up this same PCAP that we've been working with, and I popped it open in Brim. Open source, go download it. It's got a, a bunch of different uh, uh, operating systems it can work on, so go ahead and pick your flavor. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come over here and just for this PCAP. It's free software, right? 
Yeah. Yep. Open source, totally open source. So I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to zoom, 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 zoom into this little bar over there on the side. And it's coming in. All right. So basically what this shows me is over time for this PCAP, what conversations were held, where, and with whom. Now, something that I like about Brim is I can come down here and just say, whoa, alert. Hmm. That doesn't look right. So why don't I just take alert if I want, <laughs> right? I can write it up straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Go I mean, anybody's eyes could catch that. I hope. Let me right click it and say filter as value. Let's take a look at some of the alerts that it figured out. Check out 8082. Check out some of those ports. In fact, if I back up, let me just come over here. So my alert, malware trick bot check in response. That took five seconds from a PCAP. And you can filter for alerts, can you? Just like any alerts, and then it'll show you what it thinks is bad, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. We can either filter for that value, or another thing I can do is come over here to the side and I can say, okay, coming down here, I can even use Suricot alerts. Right, so hey, you got potentially bad traffic, malware command and control, network trojan was detected. I can take this and then I can pivot and go back into that actual alert and then I can even pivot further and go back into the packets. You see my little fin up here? So yeah. I'm not gonna go too far on Brim, but I can select that conversation. This gives me more of my fire alarm level view if I have a very large data set. And it allows me to pick out these things that my eyes should go to. I approached this backwards from the way a lot of peop people might approach it. They might go to Brim first and do that high level. I wanted you to start on the wire just so you can see the actual anatomy of an attack and how this progresses and down to the packet level showing the kind of data that was sent out. So now I, I absolutely complement what Wireshark sees with a tool like this. I think it's important what you do, Chris, because if you understand the low level stuff, it's gonna help you catch stuff that these tools might not catch. Um, it's good to have an understanding and then use the automated tools. But if you just use automated tools, you're kind of blind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could have a self-driving car and it could get me from A to B, but what if something happens? <laughs> you yeah. know, I still, still yeah. need to know how to drive. Or uh, the other thing about our IDS IPS systems, they're watching only on certain links. Like take the example of the client I was talking to you about where we found some scan traffic. Uh, they had an IDS IPS, but it wasn't picking it up because those packets never crossed that uh, connection that was being analyzed. The C2 traffic, the attacker, I think, was coming in over probably an encrypted C2 conversation, probably on port 443. So it just looked like any old web traffic and it was being let in. Chris, you said that you'd show us how to do this like in real world, like large data sets. Have you got an example of that? Or like I do. jumping the gun again? Not at all. No, you're doing, that's a, that's a natural next question. Like, okay, this is an isolated PCAP from a yeah. known infection. How do you actually find this stuff? And uh, let me go ahead and show you from the PCAP we already have. So first of all, um, one way that, that I like to do some scanning or just, just, just uh, again, high level stuff, kind of like what you're seeing, we did it packet by packet in the user interface. But an important tool I'd like everybody to start to get used to is a command line tool called T Shark, and that's Terminal Shark. If you have Wireshark installed, it wants to install Terminal Shark as well. Uh, so if you just type in T Shark, so this is, I'm actually starting to capture traffic right now, <laughs> right? So T Shark, let me, um, let me make sure you understand as well, though, T-Shark is a part of my path variable here on my, my system. So if I just do print and I say path, okay. So I actually added applications, Wireshark app, context, Mac OS to my system. You can do the same if you're on a Windows system. You can uh, go ahead and go to your path variable, which is in your environment variables, and you can add its uh, program files slash Wireshark. That's, that's where all of those command line tools are installed. And then you'll be able to run those command line tools from anywhere in your system. And uh, I'll go ahead and demonstrate a little bit the, f of this for you. So let me go ahead and just see, first of all, what I have here in this folder. I have my malware analysis.pcap. I also saw reverse shell in case we had time for it. Might have to do that another time. But anyway, so what I can do is I can say, hey, T-Shark, go ahead and read in my first malware analysis pcap. Read that. And then from here, I can decide, 
do I want to take a look at conversations? Just go ahead and pull out all the conversations. Uh, do I want to look at user agents? Do I want to filter on uh, specific signatures? So let me do this. We've already seen this, so I'm going to use the dash T fields. Okay? This is where I tell T Shark, I want to take the field that I'm going to indicate for you and either print it here on the command line or copy it to a text file. And the field that I'm going to be interested in is dash E. That's how I indicate what field I'm talking about. So I first say, go look at a field. Look at this field. The field I'm going to say is HTTP dot user underscore agent. So the, where I get that from, you might be thinking, how do I remember that? Well, remember when we were back in the packets, you actually have a, a cheat sheet here. I'm going to go to my get. I'm going to collapse TCP, open up HTTP. You see user agent curl. Remember we saw that first? Yeah. yeah. Look down here to the low left. HTTP dot user underscore agent. All I'm telling T-Shark is to take this field, pull it out, and put it on my command line. Let's see what happens. So first, if I just hit this, it's actually going to run through the entire PCAP, and you can kind of saw a couple of them blip by, but I, I don't want to just have those blip by. I want to actually isolate them. So what I can do is I can say dash Y, which is a filter, HTTP dot user underscore agent. Okay. So what that does is it says filter only for the packets that have a user agent. All right. So what I did is I focused now only on packets that actually have a user agent. Okay. So I can see I've got a few of them. I got this Mozilla 4.0, WinHTTP, curl. You notice that I have a few copies, a few uh, doubles. So what I can do here is I can just say, okay, let me up arrow again. Actually, you know, let me, I'm going to say, I'm going to go, go ahead and use sort. And what that'll do is it'll sort it, but it'll also, if I say unique, what that'll do is it'll only show me the unique user agents. So now I can take and run this against a huge PCAP, and it can pull out the user agents that are unique within that PCAP. And I'm going to tell you, these ones start to jump out to you because all these other ones just start to look like this. You start to see, okay, I can even run this against a user agent checker just to see what uh, type of user agent it came from. But this is one way that I can parse, um, I, I can parse larger data sets. I could also do the same with DNS names. I can say, forget all this packet, let me just export all of the DNS names that I'm scanning for or, or that are a part of that PCAP. Um, also, another one that I could do and this is this one's going to be real world, everybody. So let's go ahead and modify this. In fact, you know what? Let me, let me, uh, let me just clear. All right, let's do a real, real world, world one that you could do right now on your network back home, or in your um, enterprise environment. Let's do T Shark read. Okay, let's read in the uh, same malware example. Okay, and I'm going to say I only want to see. Uh, I'm going to say so dash Y, which is a filter. And I'm going to say TCP port equals equals 443. So I'm looking for secure web. And I'm going to say dash T out fields again. And I'm going to say dash E, but this time I want the, let's go back into Wireshark. Let's go ahead and remove. I'm going to show you where I actually get this from. It's not just coming from the top of my head. I want the version, tls.handshake.version. Go ahead and pull that out, tls.hand. Did I spell that right? TLA. Hand shake dot version. Okay, let's pull that out. I'm just going to do a sort on that. Let's do unique as well. All right, so in this PCAP, there's only one. But this tells me, if I come back here, you see TLS 1.0. So 0301 yeah. means TLS 1.0. So I should be seeing 304 or 303. So thankfully, they just count up. 301 is TLS 1.0, 302 is 1.1, 303, 3.2, or 1.2, and then 1.3, respectively. So if I ever see those, ooh, I don't want to see some old TLS client hello versions. So this is where I could start to, if I had large data sets, if I had gig files, 
which I could show you as well, maybe on another video or if we have time now, how to capture and stream that to basically capture, 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 save, capture, 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 save, and just have, have a whole section of a hard drive full of captured data from that day. What I can do is I can take this value or th this uh, command and then I can script it to run against all of those different files and it can rip out all of the low hanging fruit there. Yeah, so Chris, can you give us an example of like a, like a large amount of data? Because the problem with a lot of the training, and that's what I love about talking with you is, you know, people have these like um, cookie cutter type PCAPs. Have you got an example with like crazy amount of data, like gigs of data that we can just filter through? Sure, 100%. Uh, let me go ahead and show you. So here on my screen, I actually have some sample data. Now, of course, I can't really ever use client data to protect everybody. Yeah. But this is a larger data set. If you take a look at, uh, basically, I call this ring buffer. And you can see over here the size. This is gig, 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 gig basically. So we got 11 gigs of data here, or, or close. Right, so I don't want to pop open one, go to the user interface, take a look at uh, uh, old versions of TLS and uh, take a look at uh, user agent strings and such things like that um, on a file by file basis. Instead, what I'd like to do is be able to script that. So uh, what I'm able to do, I actually created a script and um, I'll first show you how it works and then I'll show you how I made it. And again, this is all part of the threat hunting course. So uh, hopefully you guys will check it out when we drop it. Uh, but basically, I'm just going to do uh, threat hunt. And this is a script that's going to start running. Now, let me show you what this does. So first thing it does is it first goes into each file. And the first thing it's going to do is create a DNS folder. It's going to go into each file, and it's going to rip out just the DNS data from that folder. Now, I could be more specific. If I wanted to look for a certain domain, a certain, um, if, if I'm just suspect of a certain type of call, then I can be very specific to that, that uh, thing that I, I comb for. All right, so it's going to rip all that out, and then it's going to create a separate PCAP for everything it found within each, pa within each larger data set. After this, what it's going to do is merge everything together, and then it's just going to leave me with one PCAP that, that I call all DNS. And so now that part of the script, what it does is it just, it pulls out all the DNS, rips it out for me. And now I can just look through that DNS traffic. If I wanted to be, again, if I want to be more specific, I could do that. Another aspect of the script is it's going to, we're going to see this happen since it's running live. Let's give it just a minute to run. Okay. So, so this one just finished. So I got all DNS now. So, okay, that's done. And it went ahead and erased all the other previous PCAPs. It did that with a tool called merge cap. Next I go for strange ports. So I built a filter within the script that it will say, okay, ignore port 443, port 80, some just normal ports, maybe port 8000, even though things can hide in those ports. However, I'm looking for the one-offs, the weird ones. So go ahead and pull out all the non-normal web traffic ports and just show me any of those. And so now it's going through and ripping all of those out and making separate uh, PCAPs for me. Okay, it's going to do the same thing for strange country codes. It's going to do the same thing for old versions of TLS. And so the way this happens, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the script. All right, so if I come in here, I'm just going to open this with a text editor. All right, so this is just one example, everybody. So basically what I'm telling it, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not huge on scripting. This is something that I modify and just depending on the environment I'm in. This is where I say, okay, make a directory DNS, go ahead and pull out DNS, go ahead and save that to a new DNS file, right? So I say, okay, for F in ring. So ring is where that actual location is. For all the files in that folder, do T shark, throw this filter at it, go ahead and write that to another file with that name, and then you're done. Once you're done doing, doing all of those files in that folder, now I want you to go and merge them together. Now let's merge cap, write all DNS, and your source is going to be everything in that folder. After that, remove it. So I just did this for DNS, strings, ports, TLS versions, and map scans. Remember I told you before? Show me everything with a sin that's one, an act that's zero, and a window size of 1024. If I start to see a bunch of hits here, I'm starting to see Nmap-like signatures. And also uh, countries that I'm not typically talking to. 
So using this kind of script, David, this is where, let me go back to my ring buffer. So this is where I can take a large, large data set and I can create different filters or different uh, types of signatures that I'm going to be interested in threat hunting and throw it at a much larger data set, boil that down, and I can start to look more specifically at those packets. I'm always going to do that, though, in conjunction with a tool like Brim. Also, I can run Circata logs against this, take a look at some of the deeper Circata logs, and just uh, be able to take a large data set and just look at it from more of a fire alarm level. Chris, I mean, this is fantastic, but it, we, we don't have enough time to go through all of this. This is where you, you're going to add this to the course, is that right? This is already built in. It's already part of the course. Great. So, so what I do this is This is what I, you're teaching at DEF CON and other places, right? Yes, I'm going to be teaching this at DEF CON. This is also part of my Threat Hunting with Wireshark course. Uh, keep in mind that we build to this over uh, several exercises. So, I mean, this is a lot to take in right, right away. Yeah. And again, you might be thinking, okay, what do I look for? Well, in the course, uh, we go and we look at uh, command and control traffic. We look at exfil traffic. We look, f we look at uh, lateral movement indicators. Uh, in, the, in the course, what I do is I take the, the MITRE attack framework or the Cyber Kill Chain by Lockheed Martin. And what those do is they give us a picture of how an attack works from start to finish. Um, how does attacker first get in? So in the course, uh, once we get to this point, we're our, we've already learned the life cycle of an attack. And that's part of what threat, threat hunting is. We have to know our adversary. In order to be able to find an attacker, it's good to think like one. So we go through and we take a look at uh, how does an attacker initially get in? What are some of the signatures of that? Or, or how does it actually happen? Then how do they move laterally and find other systems? How do they discover a network, not just Nmap, but other tools? And what does that look like on the packet level? The reason why we do it is because you now understand better of how that attack lifecycle actually happens, and you have a better understanding of how to find it on the wire. So using frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK and Cyber Kill Chain, we at least get an understanding Okay, they first get in, then they uh, overcome a machine, and then they try to move laterally. They try to get to the crown jewels, then get that important data out. So uh, those are things that, again, they can overwrite uh, syslogs. They can uh, wipe processes, but they can't wipe packets. That's why Wireshark and these tools that we've talked about today know as threat hunters, which isn't just the SOC team people. This is help desk. This is network technicians. This is network engineers. Anybody that's interested in cybersecurity that wants to pivot over, you have access to those packets. So now it's just capturing them and then learning to find the, the ones, the strange ones that pop out. Chris, this is amazing. I'm really glad that you've decided to teach this. And thanks for, you know, teaching this at DEF CON, but also creating a course that people can access, which I'll again link below. Really appreciate you putting all this work in. I know it's been a journey for you. Hey, I have fun. This is great. I have a great time. But I want to thank everybody that is watching the video. And I just want to encourage you that, hey, I, I feel overwhelmed too. Sometimes I yeah. open up a PCAP and I initially might not know what to look, to look for. And I don't always get to the, the exact right place just within a few clicks. Uh, sometimes it takes some time. So be patient with yourself. Uh, stick to those fundamentals. Learn them well. And you will start to see some strange-looking traffic. Find it and understand it with Wireshark. It's brilliant, Chris. Thanks so much. You bet. You bet.